Welcome everybody to this month's edition of Chamber Chat. We're so excited and thrilled that you're spending a few minutes with us today, but we're even more thrilled to have with us a special guest, our State Insurance Commissioner, Glenn Mulready. Glenn, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Appreciate, Appreciate you coming to Norman, spending some time with us yeah, today. Yeah, good. We're, we're, we're spending the whole day in Norman from coffee this morning on through uh, speaking of dinner tonight, so we'll be in Norman all day today. We'll come down often and see us. Well now, a lot of people out there probably don't know this, but Commissioner Mulready and I, we spent a few years together in the state legislature. You were elected uh, from a district over in Tulsa, Jinx area in 2010. Yeah. So we spent about seven years uh, of our legislative career together, and then you've gone on to bigger and better things, and is now a statewide elected official. Yeah, yeah, I represented uh, uh, West Tulsa, Jinx, Glenpool, Berry Hill, a little bit of Berry Hill, that, that area on the Highway 75 corridor, if your crew is familiar with that. So those were good years. Not easy. <laughs> Not easy, but still Great rewarding questions. though. Yeah. So uh, insurance, I mean, you, this has been your whole career. I mean, you're leading the state with these efforts now, but this wasn't anything new to you, your entire professional career, right? Yeah, my, my whole life has been spent in the insurance uh, industry. I, I grew up as a little kid just wanting to be an insurance agent. <laughs> okay, not really, but uh, <laughs> I did, uh, been in the business now for 35 years in the insurance business. And so um, started out as an agent broker uh, and uh, really was in some property and casualty business uh, in another state and, uh, and then relocated to Oklahoma uh, back in 96. My wife's from here. Her, uh, her dad's health wasn't good, which is what the big draw was mm -hmm. to, to get, get out here. And so uh, then went to work on the insurance company side where I, I really ended up serving as an executive on two different health insurance companies. And, uh, and then about 12 years ago, I guess it was, left there and, and went back on the uh, independent agent broker side working with the companies um, with their employee benefits. So, so you mentioned your wife. Uh, you and Sally are the proud parents of three boys, right? We are. And uh, you've got a college age student and then two that are almost wrapped up in high school, right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, Sally and I got married uh, coming up on 32 years ago. Awesome. And um, we had uh, you know, kind of interesting part of our story, 12 years we weren't able to have children, just kind of out of the blue, just weren't able to. And wow. suddenly we could and we were old. And so we uh, <laughs> have three, three young sons and uh, we have our oldest as a sophomore at, uh, at, at another university in Oklahoma. Let's not mention Oklahoma. where that is. Yeah, let's not mention that. <laughs> I'm, I'm being culturally sensitive <laughs> here. And then uh, two that are at Jinx High School, yeah, a senior and a junior. So. Now, Lots of energy. I can only imagine. We've got four little ones, but we're not quite where you are, so we'll get there eventually. Uh, let's talk about what it's like to, you know, you, you go from private, being in the, in the private sector, um, providing insurance to clients and things. You get elected to the legislature. You're a legislator from uh, the northeastern part of the state, Tulsa area. Uh, what's it like having to make that journey, you know, four months out of the year, transitioning and trying to balance uh, the work? You know, you, you, have, you have a career that's happening, but then also trying to serve your constituents. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so in the legislative role, it was, um, it was tough. You really need to be in a position where you can just step away for at least four months. I mean, the, the session is four, but, you know, really five or six months that you're really stepping away from your job. So that takes a pretty unique situation. I had a supportive group that I was part of. We had a team, 12 or 15 employees back there who really picked up the slack. Um, but I think too, the other difficult part, as you know, as someone who values family, mm -hmm. um, is just the family sacrifice. You know, I, mm -hmm. I've kept an apartment here on, on this side of the state uh, since I was elected. And uh, y you know, you you're, you're leaving your family for a few nights a week. And uh, I developed a schedule in the legislature where I would come over Monday morning, stay Monday night, drive back Tuesday night, just in time to have dinner with the family, hopefully <laughs> breakfast in the morning with the boys, drop them at school and get back on the turnpike. Uh. And that really worked pretty well to break it up. Uh, later as they got older uh, and their schedules changed that, you know, we didn't have breakfast in the morning because they're still sleeping and they weren't <laughs> going to get dropped off at the bus. And so that has changed a little bit, but it's quite a sacrifice for the family. But, you know, we've, we went into this as a family decision and thought it was a next step to have greater influence within our state in a positive way. So 
um, but it is it's not easy the family sacrifice so what's been the transition like going from the state legislature to a statewide elected office so the the nice thing about and I, I don't want this to come across wrong but um, being insurance commissioner and, and and overseeing this agency that serves uh, really everyone in the state of Oklahoma I mean the insurance world impacts literally everyone in our state but um, the nice thing is I can ask a question I can turn over a rock as I like to say and now why do we do that and I get an answer and if I think that's not the best answer for us to serve Oklahomans, I can say, we're going to change that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The legislatures, you know, you can't do that, right? right. you got to get it through committee, and then you got to get it on the floor, and then you got to get 50 people to agree with you. And so uh, that has been nice to be able to affect quicker change, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, the other thing I've enjoyed in the, in the role is, uh, as a legislator, I always felt like I was helping Oklahomans, and I was trying and doing the right thing for Oklahomans. But uh, at the insurance department, we, we can help folks in a very practical, meaningful, and, and quick way. And that's been very rewarding. So if someone's got a, uh, you know, I had a great story. I was at an event, a big, big, big fundraiser. We're at a big hotel, and uh, they introduced elected officials. And I had a gentleman afterwards come over and squat right by me and, and just shook my hand, introduced himself, and just profusely thanking me for what I had done. And um, it was a situation where I didn't do it. I learned of the situation. I passed it to my team. And, uh, but he had a granddaughter who had been born in another country with their intestines outside of their body. And they were having trouble getting them back into the States for serious treatment. And so we, we helped. And uh, so, I mean, you can't replace awesome. that almost tear-filled moment, you know, yeah. that to help in a very practical manner in a very practical situation. That's been a rewarding part that I really didn't count on when sure. thinking about the department. So. That's awesome. Well, talk to us about the department, because I don't think people probably have a great appreciation for the scope or the breadth of the insurance department. Yeah, so we have uh, about 125 employees. We literally just moved into a new building uh, very recently, we, we built a new building in my first year in office. It, it had started prior to me coming into yeah. office, but it was just completed. Is and, that on uh, Lincoln or? 50th and Lincoln. Okay. Yeah, just, just, what is that, two miles north of the Capitol. It's yeah. a great location right off the highway. Um, so we're, we're excited to have our team there. A better scenario, better setting to serve the public. But um, some things folks may not know about, we, of course, we, are, we regulate and oversee the whole insurance industry. Licensing of agents and brokers or 200,000 of them licensed in Oklahoma. Uh, don't be scared, every one of your neighbors isn't one. You, that, that includes people that live out of state but are licensed okay. in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I saw your reaction the same, time, the same way I reacted when I heard that number. But, uh, but we also are responsible for bail bondsmen uh, and then for real estate appraisers. So these are some of the other things that wow. come under our umbrella that a lot of folks may not know. We have an anti-fraud unit, which are mainly made up of uh, our officers, our, our um, former Oklahoma City PD or Tulsa PD typically, but mm -hmm. former law enforcement uh, officials who are investigating fraud within our licensee. So that might be an agent or broker, might be a bail bondsman, but uh, we, we, we uh, investigate and um, take care of those folks uh, in the way they should be taken care of. So that, that's what we oversee. But the other piece that folks may not be aware of is uh, how much we generate for the state of Oklahoma. We, we generate almost $350 million. Wow to the state of Oklahoma and so uh, that money flows through the insurance department to uh, the uh, state of Oklahoma. Uh, the premium taxes that are paid, our premium tax in Oklahoma is two and a quarter percent. So out of every dollar, two and a quarter percent of that um, goes towards a big part of that, 55 percent of that goes towards our public safety pension. So our okay. police and law enforcement and fire pensions, 55% of all premium taxes go toward that. The other 45% goes to general revenue. So you know, we've, we are a real large generator of revenue for the state of Oklahoma. So really, and your, and your operational budget is quite small, relatively speaking, to what the uh, revenue you're generating, Yes, right? Yeah, we, we operate on about a $15 million uh, budget. Okay. So you're a big contributor then to those two areas, whether it be pensions or to the general fund of the state. Then. We are. We're one of the, what, what you know, in our old world is referred to as a non-appropriated agency. We, we don't take money from the state. We contribute substantially. So you have an office in Oklahoma City, Tulsa. Are there other uh, regional offices around the state or just those two No, locations? we just have the, t the two offices. The Tulsa office 
has, uh, has some anti-fraud officers there to cover the eastern half of the state. We've got uh, some field reps there who are out in the communities as well. And then uh, we also have a program that we operate uh, through federal dollars, through federal grants, the Medicare Assistance Program, MAP is what we call it. And so we've got a handful of folks who are assisting seniors, uh, often might come into our office, and uh, they're trying to make a decision on what they're going to do from a Medicare standpoint, a Medicare supplement policy. So we don't sell anything, but we, we just uh, advise and consult them. And so uh, we have uh, one person there in our Tulsa office that does that, that was along with a few that are in our uh, Oklahoma City office. So we're in the middle of the legislative session right now. So talk to us about maybe some of your priorities that the department has for the, for the session. Yeah, my, uh, my, my team teases me a little bit because, you know, in our days, we, you were limited to eight bills. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now they think I'm trying to make up for that with some other <laughs> ideas. I really am not. But uh, our biggest priority is uh, surprise billing. And so I, uh, we ran a bill last year, uh, uh, Representative McIntyre uh, is the House author on that. But the, the issue that is out there that is just unfair to consumers is going to an in-network hospital, they choose a hospital that's in their network. They choose a physician or surgeon that's in their network. And then weeks later, sometime later, they get a bill from some provider, often an anesthesiologist or a radiologist or someone like that that was not in their network. But they didn't get to make that choice. You know, it was, it was not a choice point. There was no point where they made the decision to go out of network. And so that's what what's, is called a surprise bill. So they're now stuck with some pretty high bills yeah. out of network claims. So. We're trying to pull the patient out of the middle of that and, and get that resolved. As you can imagine, trying to find a balance, trying to split the baby, yeah. if you will, between the providers and the health plans and what is a reasonable and fair and reasonable amount is, is just difficult. And um, I've told a number of folks what I tried to do last year was get to a bill that nobody loved, <laughs> right? Did <laughs> you know that's usually good yeah. legislation. If both sides don't love it but can live with it. We weren't able to get there last year. We're hopeful that we can get there this year and, and take the patient out of that middle. Well, it's a real issue, right? I and mean, we've all been faced with that. And yep. the patient who's gone through some trial, tribulation, hardship, health, you know, health-related procedure or something, then they're all of a sudden surprised with this huge bill. So right. Thanks yeah. for looking out for them. And that is different than um, a situation where uh, uh, an Oklahoman chooses to go to some specialist because they believe they're the best right. and they're out of network. That's a very different decision versus yeah. someone opening a bill for, um, I'm not picking on anesthesiologists, but that, that's a common one that uh, they didn't choose and now they're mm -hmm. getting stuck with that uh, stuck with that bill. So hopefully we can get that. Addressed. Well, good luck. Yeah, I hope, you, I hope by the end of session that's a success. So uh, we're, we're kind of towards the end of, of winter storm season, getting ready to enter into the spring storm season. I assume uh, your agency is intimately aware of severe weather and things. Do you have any advice and tips for the average citizen out there as we transition to seasons right now? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. We, we launched a campaign uh, last year uh, at about this time where, um, you know, don't laugh. Uh, Mulready says get ready, but it was about That's preparing, good. I like it. <laughs> preparing for storm season last year. And, uh, you know, we realized pretty early on that that could carry forward to other topics, whether that's flood insurance mm -hmm. or, or retirement. What are you doing for retirement? You know, but sort of get ready and be, be prepared. And so uh, we're going to continue that. Uh, we think that that has some many different applications that we can use to bring awareness uh, to folks. But, but yeah, on the storm um, front, I think key thing is you know, number one, being in touch with your agent, making sure your coverage is in place and, and what you do have for coverage and know your, what your deductible amount is. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, just on a coverage standpoint, don't understand that a standard homeowner's policy doesn't cover flood insurance, doesn't cover flood, it's excluded, doesn't cover earthquake. You can add those through other coverages, but on the standard homeowners, that's not covered. Another thing we highly encourage is to do a home inventory. You know, if, if a storm blows through and you lose your house, you lose everything, you're looking at a slab and you're trying to recreate what was in that room, yeah. um, that's not easy. And then to, if you've got to document that, so uh, the thing to do is do that before the storm's coming, get ready. And, um, you know, we have forms available on our website to help walk through that. But also everyone's got a phone with, they can snap <coughs> pictures, they can shoot video, literally walking around their house 
documenting some of the more expensive items, serial numbers, that, that sort of thing. So, uh, and then, a key part, don't store that in your house. <laughs> Either <laughs> so store it in the cloud, or if it's on paper, store that off-site somewhere. But that's a way to prepare, too. Now, in your, I mean, you've, you got elected in 2018 to this position, uh, but even in the end of 18, last year, and here we are in 2020, uh, we've had a lot of severe storms already, but um, I, I have to believe that Oklahoma is very, really unique. I mean, in one year, we could have um, winter storms, ice storms, tornadoes, fires, flooding. I mean, the, really the gamut. E well, earthquakes. In 48 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. What's, that, what's that like, or have you had conversations with your uh, contemporaries in other states about, what it's like to be in Oklahoma and how maybe compared to another state where it's not, not quite as diverse. Yeah, so, so the NEIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, is a very active organization. I, I just came from a meeting with, where all the commissioners came together, so we have lots of opportunities to have those sort of conversations. And, um, you know, we, we have quite a mix. You know, there are many states that, you know, L Louisiana or Florida, you know, dealing with coastal storms. Um, uh, you know, California's got earthquakes and wildfires, but we really have quite the, the full gamut of, right. of exposures. And in fact, in my first six months in office, we had the second most tornadoes in the history of Oklahoma. Wow. Uh, and the worst flooding in the history of Oklahoma. Now, as commissioner, I could have done, <laughs> with, done without that, but the people of Oklahoma could have done without that too. But yeah. um, it really gave me some good exposure to um, how we respond and um, really made some good connection with the folks at emergency management that I might not have had previously. Uh, and we've got a great team over there at emergency management. Um, luckily, with the tornadoes we had uh, last year, they were, they were out in rural communities. They were smaller. Now, we did, there were two deaths in the El Reno uh, tornado, which are, are really unfortunate. But the, the thing that stands out for me is I think of my last, my first year is on the flood side of things. So when we have a tornado come through, when I visited El Reno, really good example. We have, you know, tens of million dollars of damage, but 90% of it is insured. Yeah. So you come in, you assess the damage, you clean up, you rebuild. With flood, what I found as we went around was 90% of it was uninsured. Wow. And it's a very different cleanup. It's a really slow, painful, gross, for lack of a better word, uh, clean up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's sad, I mean, because you've got folks looking for answers that don't have coverage. And so um, what was especially sad was one community, I, not far from my house, I mean, probably 20 minutes from where, where we live, I was up there Memorial Day weekend. I'm out in a boat with the county sheriff and a uh, county commissioner and a TV crew, and I've got my phone up with the GPS so that the boat driver can try to stay in the streets because you don't want to wow. hit mailboxes or fences Man. or something. And, and that was sort of uh, surreal. But then also, I met with a group of neighbors at that same day and, um, you know, they, they weren't angry. They were just, but they were looking for answers. And there were a number of them who did have flood insurance, but the mapping changed. And so they got a notification from their bank saying they were no longer required to have flood insurance. And I, I quote the word required because truly, you know, to have a federal loan, they weren't required to have flood insurance. Clearly, they still needed flood insurance. Many of them had four feet of water in their mm -hmm. home. And so that was really sad when folks dropped coverage that they did have. And so I like to say that if it rains where you live, it can flood where you live. Sure. <laughs> and so uh, if, if uh, once water hits the ground, uh, it's really no longer covered under your homeowner's policy. So that's a, it's a very oversimplified way to explain that on a standard homeowner's policy. If it comes in through your window or through your roof, any water or damage, that's covered. But once it hits the ground, it really kind of becomes a flood loss. And so folks need to be aware of that. I think the other thing, a couple untruths that I learned in that process are that anybody can buy flood insurance. Doesn't matter whether you're in a zone or not in a zone, or anybody can buy flood insurance. And it's not near as expensive as I think a lot of people think. Average premium across the state of Oklahoma for those that have it is about $550 a year. So um, those are some fallacies as I went around. They just, folks thought it was too expensive, thought they couldn't buy it. And so um, when I'm out speaking publicly, I try to always talk a little bit about flood insurance. Yeah, encourage people to get with their agent yeah. and look into that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up our conversation, 
uh, you and your team, I know, really want to be responsive and, and be there for people, and that's what it's all about. Uh, how would you encourage people to get in touch uh, with you guys? What's the best ways to do that? So we would, we would love them to come by our new building at some point okay. if they're up in the area and just to mm -hmm. see the new building that uh, we <coughs> established for the state of Oklahoma at 50th and Lincoln. But uh, really our website is the best way to interact with us. So we also have a Facebook page, but okay. at our website at oid.ok.gov. Okay. And uh, we recently launched about a month or so ago, maybe, maybe two months ago, a new website, which I think is a lot more user friendly. And um, so I would encourage them to go and surf around our website. We have a consumer assistance area um, that uh, they're handling calls all day, every day uh, for folks that need help. So it might be a homeowner's claim, an auto claim, a health insurance claim that is not being handled the way they would like it to, to be. They need to call us and they, they will complete a short just give us some details, a request for assistance. We then contact the insurance company on their behalf. And uh, in my first six months in office, we recovered $5.1 million wow. for Oklahomans in six That's months. That's great. As compared to 3.8 the whole year before. So we've got a real active consumer assistance area that is there to help people that a lot of people don't know that's available to them. And that was OID.gov? OID.ok.gov. .ok. Okay. OID.ok.gov. Yep. Sounds like a great resource. Yeah, so, it is. Awesome. Well, Commissioner Mulready, thank you so much for being with us today. We, we appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on. Good yeah. to be here in Norman. Thanks, Glenn. Okay. Everybody, thanks for tuning in today for this edition of Chamber Chat. We were thrilled to have Commissioner Mulready with us today. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Until then, we look forward to seeing you real soon. Take care.